Welcome to Life Drawing Live from the historic Life Room, live streamed from the Royal Academy Schools. Uh, 250 years old, founded a few weeks after the Academy itself, and very much at the literal as well as metaphorical heart of the institution. And the Life Room is at the heart of the schools themselves. This one is about 150 years old, founded in the 1860s, but the furniture came from the original Academy at Somerset House, so it's fair to say that the benches on which the students sit, and students are sitting tonight, played host to the youthful buttocks of Turner, Constable, Blake and others. We're going to look at aspects of the history of life drawing at the Academy tonight. We're going to look at some extraordinary objects, both living and gruesome, that are used to facilitate that. And also some world-class works of art in an exhibition about to open upstairs at the Academy exploring the Renaissance nude, including some breathtaking anatomical drawings by Leonardo da Vinci. But the main thrust of the evening is a live life class at your home and simultaneously here in the room. So don't be shy. In order to share, please send your drawings in. Once you do them, get a crit. Uh, let's, let's, let's let um, everyone have a look at them. Um, and to take the class, is uh, teacher, writer, artist Sarah Simlet, who's here raring to go, yes. as we all are. Yes, Sarah, actually. just give us a brief overview of what, 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 what the plan is. Brief overview. You have about an hour and a half of drawing this evening. We're going to organise that into four parts. I'm going to take you through elementary drawing exercises and talk about different aspects of drawing that I hope are going to be useful for you at home. Possibly fitting in more than you normally would in an hour and a half, but because we're recording this, it gives you the opportunity to return to the different suggestions questions that I'm going to make. We're going to also look at some historic works of art on screen and some wonderful sculptures and uh, have a surprise visitor for the end of the session as yeah, well. We've got a surprise visitor at the beginning too because we have yes. a live model, Andrew, who's, we do. Who, who needs warming up and, he does. And, and you need to get him in pose. I do, yes. Is Andrew with us? He's not. Well, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Andrew? Oh, here he comes. Okay. Wonderful. Always good to make an entry. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Right. <laughs> okay. So we're going to start with a series of short poses which we're going to use as an opportunity to warm up, to focus, to acclimatise, to being here and beginning to draw. You've got to warm up the muscles in your hands and your arms. You've also got to focus your mind as well on the process of drawing. So I'll go and join Andrew and I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, the, the purpose and the usefulness of short poses in a life drawing class. And I'll try to keep that brief so as to give you the opportunity to draw. We will have three very rapid poses after I've just talked to you about a few of the key elements that might be useful. But the key is to go for it, isn't it? Just to it, try, apply yes. pencil to paper. Absolutely. Uh, it's, good, it's very positive and constructive to make mistakes. And it doesn't actually matter. It's just a piece of paper and it's just a pencil. So the first thing that's important to realise when you're starting to draw is that your whole body is involved in that process. It's not something that's just wrist and hands at the end here, but actually drawing comes from the centre of you. Or if we were in a music class and you were studying the violin or something, no doubt your teacher would talk about the muscles of the back going up into the shoulder and the importance of upper body movement. It's the same in drawing. So make sure that you're comfortable, whether you're here in the class with us or you're working from home, it's very important that you're physically comfortable because if you're all cramped, that's actually going to be direct reflected in your drawing. So your posture is important as well as the posture of the model. And then the other thing is the way in which you're gripping your pencil. Don't grip it too tightly, okay? So that's a kind of an exaggeration of the handwriting grip that we all learn at school. It's going to give you the tight control of hopefully uniform letters, but actually it means that there's a very restricted movement look in my fingers in terms of a spectrum of expression in your marks. Whereas as soon as you hold your pencil a little further back and more loosely, you get a huge range and looser still. Do you remember when we were children, we used to wobble our pencils like this, make them look like they're made out of rubber? So if you do something like that in the, the gentleness of the way you hold the pencil, then you're actually going to be giving fluidity and expression to your drawing straight away. Another thing that can help as well, if you're sort of somewhat addicted to the handwriting grip, is to deliberately hold it differently, like so, or perhaps between the fingers and like so. So those, or work with your unaccustomed hand that hasn't got all of those habits. So think about hold, holding your pencil quite loosely. Think about your own posture, about the free movement of your own body when you're drawing and the fact that it's going to come from the core of you, not just at your fingertips, okay? 
So we're going to have three short poses from Andrew. Now, the idea with a short pose is it gives you the opportunity to focus your mind on the process of drawing and to become sort of present and to become absorbed into it as well as warming up your own body. So the first pose, just to challenge you and keep you on your toes, is going to be for three minutes only. And really, with a three-minute pose, there isn't, the there isn't the time to worry about eyelashes and count toenails. You've got to go for your first impression for what seems to be the most interesting aspect of this pose. What do you want to say about it on the piece of paper? How would you move your pencil over the surface in order to begin to capture the essence of the form and the shapes that it's made? Another thing that with, with life drawing, when you have these very short poses, is that it's an opportunity for the model to present us with quite difficult poses that they simply couldn't hold for longer. And that's often going to result in much more interesting shapes. So now I'm going to let you focus. I won't talk too much, and hopefully I'll be told when three minutes is up. Of course, unable to resist talking, I'm going to say something again. However, you don't have to just make one drawing in three minutes. You know, you might have captured something in 40 seconds. You could make several drawings in that time. Layering your ideas is helpful. You don't need to worry about the right outline. There's no right, there's no wrong. They're your thoughts, your ideas, your first assumptions. You can change them. Often drawings are more beautiful and more interesting to look at when they show the layers of your thinking and you're changing your mind. You don't have to give Andrew only two arms and two legs. He could have several limbs, <laughs> extra limbs, fine. It doesn't matter. One minute. So is that one minute to go? This pose. Yeah, okay, so one, one more minute left with this pose. Okay. All right, that's lovely. So for the next pose, I'm going to ask Andrew to stand for four minutes. But this time, when we start, I'd like you to only look for the first minute. So it's one minute of looking, three minutes of drawing. So we'll tell you when that first minute is up. And that's because often we rush into drawing without having actually had a look properly first. And so just investing that minute in making some decisions about what's interesting this time, what's important, what do you want to work on, then, then it means that you're probably going to get a better result in those last three minutes. Okay, so we'll time one minute now of just looking. Look, think, decide what, what you want to express. Admiration, I think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to be able to hold that pose. Absolutely, I know. It's magnificent. So you could run through your drawing in your mind's eye. Decide what you want to focus on. And it means that you're taking a lot of editorial decisions now without actually drawing. You're deciding what really matters.
So by my watch, that was a minute. So now start drawing. You've got three minutes. It's important to trust your instinct with rapid poses. Don't worry about it too much. Just go for it. That was one minute, you've got two more. Not to make you anxious, of course. <laughs> it's interesting, you've asked everyone to look intently and people at home will be doing the same. Yes. So we all see the same thing. Yeah. But Except the chances of the thousands of people doing this class doing anything the remotely similar is quite... The uh, beauty of drawing is we don't see the same thing. No, not yeah. at all. We have the same subject, but... Um, so if we potentially see the same thing, you're right, we don't do it. Yeah, no, no, not at we all. We certainly don't draw the same thing. No, and that, that is one of the fantastic things about drawing. In a class like this where you have 20 people, that then we will see 20 very different interpretations of the same subject. Well, I've had a sneak yeah. view. Have you? And we are. Really? Well, that's yeah. great. Now, of course, I might have slightly lost my timing, but anyway. So I reckon that was another minute or so. So we've got one more to go. A drawing's an incredibly direct process, isn't it? It's just so immediate. The idea is straight there. You haven't got to do very much preparation. You haven't got to stretch a canvas and mix your oils or build your armature. And, uh, yeah, it's, there's something... Meditative is the wrong word because it's quite active for many people, but you certainly lose... A sense of where you are. Yes, yeah. Well, that might be something to do with the heat in a life room, which by definition it, has, to, has to keep Andrew reasonably comfortable. That is true, yes. But I think as we do become more absorbed in drawing, it, it is a meditative process. It provides wonderful escapism sometimes, yeah. Right, you've got 15 seconds, according to my watch. Yeah, and you've got a full three-minute pose. Have I? A full you three have. minutes? Yes. Oh, brilliant. I mean, for the next one. OK, excellent. Thank you. OK, so now, for the last of these short poses, I'm going to ask you to work with your unaccustomed hand. So if you're naturally right-handed, then I mean draw with your left. If you're left-handed, draw with your right. Now, the point of this, it's a classic art school exercise, OK? So it's what we all do on a foundation course. It actually means that while you expect to have less control, actually you have more control because your hand is more biddable because it's not really sure what it should be doing. So it's going to actually do as you ask, whereas the hand with all the handwriting habits is going to wander off and do its own thing. So, three minutes. Please work with your unaccustomed hand.
you just have one more minute? Can you tell from looking at an old master drawing the speed with which it's been rendered? I think so, yes. I think that the, sp I think the viewer can read the speed at which a line was made which I'll talk about when I, when I talk about mark making and the qualities of a line, but yes, I think so, yes. Okay, Andrew, thank you ever so much. Please rest now. Okay, now, we're going to move on, mm -hmm. some more historic examples, because <laughs> that's not a work of art, that's it's one of the students. No worry, but class. you've just dropped a work of <laughs> <Absolutely>. art. Absolutely. <laughs> but upstairs, on this Sunday, there's an exhibition opening here at the Royal Academy exploring the Renaissance nude from Titian and Cranach and Dürer to Michelangelo, Raphael and Leonardo da Vinci, of course. And at the heart of that exhibition, which explores many things from the classical ideal to the rise of humanism and, uh, and, and religious ideals, somehow explored through the human body is the study of anatomy. Because in order to be an artist, yes. you need to understand how to do that. Yes. And of course, yes. I think probably the undisputed master of anatomical drawing, or at least one of them, Absolutely. is Leonardo da Vinci. That's right. Um, what do we know about his anatomical training? We know that Leonardo would have studied anatomy as a student and that he studied in the workshop of Verrocchio. And so he would have gone through the classical training of learning about surface form and, and musculature. But then when he became a successful athlete, uh, artist, he had the opportunity to study anatomy himself. Over a period of 30 years, he kept revisiting the subject and in, I think, three different cities, he had access to hospitals and dissected about 30 cadavers. And so he was looking very, very directly. He was making new observations that people had not made before. And he was studying the body as an artist, an engineer and a philosopher. So he was looking deeply at the mechanics from the bones to the surface, studying it as a subject in itself, which I think is an artist's choice, that you can study anatomy as a subject in itself, or you can study anatomy purely for the application to other art, art practices. Um, with Leonardo, he's looking at the systems in the body, he's relating to, them, to the landscape, to other systems in nature, um, and he's also using what he learns in the invention of machines, while at the same time searching for the human soul which he located in the pituitary fossa, just beneath the brain, behind the eyes. Yeah, we'll leave the human we'll leave soul, the soul just for alone the moment. today. Yes. But although he wouldn't have made the distinction, we do, and he's certainly a figure who embodies anatomical studies, both as a scientific as well as artistic yes. quest, which is interesting yes. because a Royal Academician, who's a professor of drawing here, Stephen Farthing, and his brother, who's a doctor, have written a book about Leonardo, called yes. Leonardo da Vinci Under the Skin, and they're going to, just in a, in a short tape, just explore in detail a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci from the Royal Collection that's on show in the Renaissance Nude. It's clearly the result of dissection. So this is from life. Uh, as far as we can see, it's pretty accurate. There is a question as to why he has put really rather beautifully drawn heads on these torsos, these dissected torsos. And whether that is to uh, get engagement from the observer, to say, actually, these are real people, these are humans, this is human anatomy. It's about motor movements. And so it would, you know, maybe seem quite logical to him to have a thinking living head on top of it. And all he was doing was revealing the mathematics. Yeah. A bit like the watch with the glass back. John Ruskin's idea about drawing focuses on this idea of it being an aid to looking. And drawing is a slow process, and usually, and my guess is that most of Leonardo's drawings are drawn quite slowly. And that what there is is a looking process that is just as strong as a mark-making process. There's a lot of sifting of information going on and making sense of it. I think the other fascinating bit of sort of hard knowledge that we now have through proper research although I think most of us have known this intuitively, is that actually making a drawing commits it to memory. It's quite different from writing down a description of the mus muscles of the shoulder than it is making a detailed drawing of the muscle. There's lots of really good research now, usually done by psychologists, who have shown that to create a drawing at the same time as part of the learning process is a very, very helpful way of, of in, endorsing it into memory. Yes. Which would be the argument for asking students to draw 
in many subjects. It's fascinating because with all medical technology and, and modern technology, endoscopy for example, yes. the idea that drawing helps put things in the memory and yes. facilitates a deeper understanding seems to resonate with the way you're teaching today. Oh, very much so. I think that when you look at something and you draw it, you learn so much more than if you only look at it because the process of drawing makes you question your assumptions and your preconceived ideas and actually shows you what something really looks like because maybe the lines you've ended up with in the page have got to have some correlation with the thing directly in front of you. Certainly when I was teaching myself anatomy and producing dissections in Guy's Hospital and I was drawing at the same time, so if I had, say, an, uh, an upper limb that I was working on for a week, during that week I'd then make maybe 80 to 100 drawings of the same thing, working between the scalpel and the pen, one um, dismantling layers, one bringing them, you know, building them back up up again and but those drawings that I was making were not about making visual images that then I wanted to keep necessarily for reference but I was drawing for process as a way of embedding information into my mind so that at the end of the week I threw all those drawings in the bin which of course I didn't it's nice to keep them but if I had I wouldn't have lost the purpose or the value in having made them and so many students who I work with who are not necessarily art students but from many other disciplines who want to learn how to draw when they first start making observations drawing will often express to me the wonder at the fact that they'd realized this thing I've been living with that I chose because I like the object I never knew it was that shape now I can see it is because I've drawn it without daunting our students Leonardo is a sort of you know, aspiration yes. but his drawing is going to form the basis of our next exercise. And there's it a particular is. drawing that you want us just to focus on it briefly. Is. We've chosen a sheet of studies which is in the exhibition upstairs, um, which is looking at, on, on the entire, it's, it's two pages, and he has drawn the anatomy of the shoulder repeatedly from lots of different views so that he studied it from the front, the side, the back, above, below, from different layers. And that's something that seems so logical and sensible to us today that we just take it for granted without realising that it was a very innovative thing to do, had a huge influence upon anatomical textbooks in the 20th century when his drawings came to light and then, and then were studied. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very helpful way of thinking, of to look at multiple views. And then another thing that we've chosen a detail here of that sheet that is very important is that Leonardo also devised this method of reducing the muscle fibres of, of any structure to what he referred to as linen threads. Now, if you're studying musculature, it's a hugely helpful way of learning. So I use this in my teaching. I encourage my students to do this. I make clumsy blackboard drawings where I'm delineating everything as threads. And it means then that you're able to actually see where muscles originate from, where they insert, what joint they cross, and what's going to happen when those fibres actually pull in order to, to move that joint. So we're now going to focus on Andrew's um, neck and shoulder region, um, which you will see uh, in the Leonardo images as well, that I know that at home certainly you'll be able to see on the screen. And so, first of all, we have, we're going, what we're going to do is I'll talk a little bit about the anatomy. And then I'm going to encourage you all to make your own sheet of studies, like Leonardo has, where you are using drawing, in this case, as a process of thinking and analysing and trying to record and un understand and record information. So again, it's not about making a lovely work of art, but it's drawing to think about structure. So I'll talk a little about the anatomy and then... Andrew is going to rotate a pose to give you an opportunity to study different aspects of the shoulder. So first of all, you've got the bone structure. So you've got the rib cage and you have the shoulder girdle, which sits on top like a crown. The clavicle, which is an S-shaped bone, your collarbone across the front of your body here, and your shoulder blades, the scapulae, which sit at the back. The clavicle and the shoulder blades are then clothed in a lot of very thick muscles which are going to give you the power to be able to bring your arms across to the front or hold them out to the side, to be able to raise your whole shoulders while carrying very heavy weights. So shoulder muscles are powerful and they're multiply layered as well. We're only able to look at the surface ones but one of the most obvious is the pectoralis major muscle across the front of the chest which is going to arise from the lower border of the clavicle 
upon its median third, so towards the middle of the body there, then comes down the sternum and then across the fifth rib. So the border of origin, where the fibres are coming from, is going to run from here to here, going all the way around. The muscle fibres are then going to converge, come across his chest, as you can see in the Leonardo image on the screen over there, but see the other side of the body, and they twist over in order to insert onto the front of the arm. Pectoralis is the classic muscle on the front of the chest, and what it does enables you to take two things here and pull them strongly into the centre. So if Andrew now does that and flexes both of his pectoral muscles like so, or even doing something like that, then you can see, and then you can start to see muscle fibres actually running through the muscle. And you see the division here between pectoralis and one of the main shoulder muscles, the deltoid as well. So what we could do is I could actually ask you to do some sketching of the pectoral muscle while I ask Andrew to sort of, actually what you've just done is fantastic, just slowly moving through slightly different positions. So you see it as this active structure because the thing with anatomy is that you're going, you start, so while you're doing that and you can draw, okay? So we'll ask Andrew to just very, so, so choose one position, maybe stay there for about, 30 seconds to a minute, a minute or so, and then move again, and then say a minute or so, 30 seconds, as you wish, as is comfortable, and then move again. So you've got just moments to capture information, to layer it on your sheet. But also, what I was about to say was that with anatomy, when you study it from textbooks, then it looks like a load of fixed structures. And then, of course, that's just going to show you musculature at rest, usually. When you have the privilege of working with a life model, you're going to see musculature moving, and therefore you'll see single structures changing shape quite dramatically. And therefore it's important to understand what muscles do, what any one of them singularly does, so that you know whether it ought to be at rest or in tension with a, a particular given pose. We have to finish this exercise. Would you like to relax a second, Andrew? So you've got the idea that when you have a chance to work with a model, ask them to move through different poses, studying a particular muscle so you see that in action. Briefly, we'll have a look at another one, which is the deltoid on the shoulder. Or actually, no, we'll go around the back. Do you mind if we have a look at the trapezius? Right. So with the trapezius, this is a muscle which is going to have its midline from the back of the skull to the middle of the back here. And you can see the borders of it running down the side of Andrew's neck onto his shoulders. Then it comes in here on the scapula and then like a dart runs down the centre of the back. This muscle is going to help to rotate your shoulder blades in like this, but also elevate the entire shoulder girdle. So you'd use it in lifting up heavy weights um, towards your head. So it should show nicely, Andrew, if you're able to raise your shoulders up like that. And what you're doing is aiming to tense the centre of your back. Lovely. Okay. Um, so you can see that it is principally this structure in the centre here. Maybe just not your shoulder blades, just a little further apart. That's better. That's better. Okay, so like that, this is the lateral border of trapezius coming down. Sorry, don't know if I tickle you. And you can see it's uneven on either side. We're all asymmetrical. Another thing that's important with anatomy, don't expect it to be identical on both sides of the body, let alone identical among us all, because we all vary hugely. So there's a lateral border, and one coming up here, 
The shoulder blade is going to be underneath there, where I'm drawing with my fingers on his skin now. That's the shoulder blade on this side. And over on the other side, the shoulder blade is going to be underneath here. Look at the power of the muscle in the neck coming up here. And I don't know if you can catch it in this light, but you can just see the light just shining, making these lines running up the side of his neck either side. So it's, it's effectively a diamond-shaped muscle, in effect. Comes down like this, across, and down like so. So it's called trapezius. At least we've done two, trapezius and pectoralis major, and then it's study others um, in your own time later. Demand. I think yeah. it's, it's coming from all angles. They want another exercise. One more. One more. One more. You've, you've earned the right for another one. Another muscle. Another Is that muscle. what they'd like? Yes. Okay. Well, then, when should we start our other muscle? <laughs> you can start it any time in the next we, 10 seconds. We could, couldn't we? Okay, so have you just about got the, to grips with your trapezius? So the third muscle that we'll look at, threes are always pleasing, uh, is going to be your deltoid, okay? So just relax, Andrew. Now, please, could you stand so that you're side on, therefore facing me, but everyone sees the side of your shoulder. So deltoid is the big shoulder cap muscle here, which is going to be part at the front, the side, and the back of the shoulder. It's going to arise from the inferior border, sorry about the terminology, of the lateral third of your clavicle, and then come round the inferior border, which means just the underneath side of the spine of the scapula, and the fibres are going to come down, and they make this characteristic, let's just check I'm in the right place, yes, this characteristic line on the arm just coming down here. The fibres wrap around, and they insert onto the arm just at that point there. And then if Andrew could just face the front, please. So, deltoid again, you're seeing the line of it coming from here, going across down to here, and fibres coming from the back. It makes this characteristic mass on the outside of the shoulder. It's going to give the power to hold your arm up out to the side like so. Then you use the front of the muscle to bring your arm forward and the back of it to take your arm back. So if Andrew, please, you could take, to hold your arms up out to the side like this, Lovely, that's great. Of course, pectoralis major is flowing into deltoid. They sit right next to one another. But deltoid is that mass there that you see on the shoulder. And after a few moments of looking at the front view, then we'll ask Andrew if he could please turn slowly sideways and then finish up with the rear view. So we're just looking at that bulge there, that cap that covers over the top of the shoulder and always makes that characteristic dint on the outside of the arm. And then the view from the rear as well. That's the line there that you're looking for. It's just there. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. to share your drawings with us, um, send them by email or social media. Sarah, Absolutely. obviously, historically here at the Royal Academy, although we have a life room, yes. students weren't let loose on the 18th or 19th or 20th century equivalent of Andrew initially. No. How did they learn? They would have studied from plaster casts to start off with, which would be of classical sculptures, and then sometimes of dissected parts of human or animal, which they would have also as, as a cast. And so that meant that a lot of editorial decisions had already been taken uh, in terms of the pose or the position of the body. And it also means that your subject's going to stay still. And so it was only after a significant training from cast that they'd be allowed to work with a life model where it's obviously going to move and you've got to make a lot of the decisions for yourself. We have all sorts of extraordinary objects, including cast, but actually these are Corchet figures. Yes. This one known as Smuglerius in particular. Yes. Just explain what an Ecorche figure was. Ecorche is from the French for scorch, 
and it means to have it is an it is a term for a flayed body where the skin has been removed and we're able to see the subcutaneous structures or the surface muscle muscles of the body which is what artists would have classically studied this this particular figure is now available for everyone to see as they make their journey through the academy but it was originally for the schools and we, we know something of the history of the, of, the, of the poor man. It's an extraordinarily poignant object. So this was made in 1776. Six men were hanged at Tyburn for smuggling. And their bodies were taken to the Royal College of Surgeons, where William Hunter was responsible for looking after them and deciding how they would be used. Hunter was also the professor of anatomy, the first professor of anatomy right. here at the Royal Academy Schools, working under Joshua Reynolds. And Hunter felt that the body of one man who, to me, looks as though he was very young and certainly very lean, that it would be better used by the artists. So he was sent to the Royal Academy here, where the sculptor, is it Agostino Carlini? Yes. Uh, that's right. Um, he was responsible for flaying the body and then choosing the pose, and he chose the, the, the dying Gaul, which is a classical Roman sculpture, I believe, and then the body was set into this pose and plast, pl cast into plaster. So what we're able to see today is something that is this extraordinary junction between poverty, um, tax evasion, uh, the government, the, the power of the state, crime, the medical, punishment, crime, humanity. punishment, the, prof the medical profession and the arts, all coming together in this one object. So I think it's important to never forget the history of it, while at the same time, this man has become a teacher for yeah. hundreds of years, if, and we if, can learn a great deal from it. If not immortality, he he's certainly lives on in posterity. And yes. interestingly enough, I love the fact that, so it's, the body is, is then taken in, in the pursuit of scientific and artistic knowledge. Yes. It's applied to a classical sculpture. Yes. So that's two layers removed. Yes. And you now want to, let's not quite bring it back to life, you want to use this as the basis for the next exercise that's right. with Andrew. That's right. We're going to ask Andrew to take the stance of, of this écorché and so that we can make comparisons. One of the beauties of this particular pose, and I certainly strongly encourage you to visit the RA and to see this object and to study from it, is that three-dimensionally it's very beautiful and in the, the different views that you have of it. Um, and so in asking Andrew to take the same pose, then obviously you're going to, you're slightly fixed in your view rather than being able to walk around it, but I'm going to use this as an opportunity to talk more about the elements of drawing that it's useful to consider when working um, in life drawing. Okay. That's lovely. Thank you very much, Andrew. Okay. So when you have a, your inner life class and you have a long pose that you can work from, there are so many different approaches that you can take. It's your opportunity to then decide how you want to practice, what skill you want to practice, what you want to actually achieve. Which brings me to a very important aspect of drawing. If you look at the history of art, which I strongly recommend you use, look at, look at hundreds if not thousands of other artists' drawings in order to learn from them, you'll realise that when drawings are particularly strong and successful, they tend to bring about five elements and harmonise them perfectly. So these five elements I'm going to give to you as a list to write down and to bear in mind whenever you're drawing. The five things to consider the relationship between and to harmonise when making any drawing are the subject, your intention, your material, method and time. To explain those, so the subject in this case is a life model, but it could be anything that you're choosing to draw. The intention is, why are you drawing this subject? What do you want to get out of it on this occasion? The material is the one that you choose that's going to be most appropriate and helpful given your intention and what the subject is. And then with your choice of material, then of course there are myriad ways of using it. So what method of using this material would be most appropriate to this subject and your intention? And then after those four things, of course, time. How much time have you got? 
in this case, I suspect about 10 minutes or so. However, it might be that in life you've got 30 seconds before your, your subject moves or less. Or maybe you've got the next five hours or six weeks to work on something. So you're obviously going to make adjustments depending upon the amount of time that you've got, which is of the essence this evening. Now then, another thing that's worth considering, and what I'd really like to do this evening is just to share ideas that I have about the processes of learning to draw that you can keep coming back to. There isn't time for you to practice all of this right now. But another thing that matters very much is your quality of line. So I've already mentioned the thing about holding the pencil very gently so that um, you're able to um, convey a, a lot more sensitive expression than if you grip it too firmly. But also... There are elements to qualities of line. So, for example, the four things that you can adjust are the speed, the length, the direction, and the pressure. The speed is something that I think the viewer is going to pick up on when they actually look at your drawing. They'll know how fast you drew. The direction can be altered. Uh, in order to pr provide dynamic as well as, as a description of your subject. And, the, and so, so direction, speed, the length of the line as well matters very much. And then the pressure that you apply is going to, to change the density of pigment. So to give you an idea of why speed matters, for example, that if I was to draw a line for you, you have to imagine, I know while you're looking at Andrew, I'll give you something else to look at as well, that if I was making a drawing... And I was going to make a line that ran from this point here to this point here. So we know the direction and the length is fixed. If I made the line whew, at that speed, when the viewer looks at it, they will read that. And that speed has a meaning. It will change how you interpret the subject that's being described. You could, of course, describe the same line again from the same point from here to here. But this time, and I promise I won't do it, you could spend seven or eight minutes getting there. And if you did, you'd probably start to incorporate your heartbeat. Right? But the, the slowness of that line in taking eight minutes to produce would be read by the viewer. So again, you're describing the same physical thing, the same length, the same direction, perhaps with the same pressure if you're skilled enough, but it has a different meaning with that change of speed. I won't illustrate all the other examples, but those four elements, the speed, the length, direction, and the density, or pressure, when you change them, you're going to be achieving a more expressive drawing. Now then, just to cram in a bit more to think about when it comes to life drawing, of course, the more obvious thing to discuss is this business of measurement and foreshortening. So, from your view over there, you will have quite a foreshortened view of Andrew's, get my left and right, Andrew's left thigh, won't you? It's very foreshortened, coming towards you. So foreshortening is this business of the illusion, of making an illusion on a flat surface of a subject that's actually going away from you or coming towards you. It's generating a sense of perspective. Well, the way that you do that, perhaps, is to see, honest, you have to honestly draw what you see rather than what you already know. So to give you another example, if, for example, um, if you had, you were drawing some, you were drawing me and I was lying down and my feet were facing you and my head was going right away, absolutely in a straight line, you would see me have enormous feet, a very strange shaped body and a pin sized head at the other end. If you actually drew what you saw, then you'd probably end up with an image of someone who was clearly lying down and going away from you. However, you're quite likely to shrink the size of the feet change the shape of the body so it looks a bit more human, and increase the size of the head. As a result, your lying down figure is going to keep pinging up at about a 45 degree angle on the piece of paper. So, in order to get foreshortening to actually work, figures to lie in space, you've got to honestly draw what you actually see. So, a tool that can help you with that is the business of what's described as measuring. Although, actually, I think it's misnamed and it's more a case of, um, of, of comparing. So, again, you want the pencil out. Now, I'm hoping it's most helpful for me to stand here and to demonstrate measuring pointing in that direction. Of course, it would be better from my point of view if I was over with you actually looking at Andrew. Maybe I should measure Tim. <laughs> anyway, so, no. um, so um, 
what I could do is that you, so what you need to do is when you are drawing a subject, okay, you've got to have your shoulders straight on to your subject and you've got to project your arm out absolutely straight. It's no good measuring with an elbow bent like this and then carrying on drawing and then going back and measuring at a slightly different distance and drawing. It'll all end up a muddle. You've got to consistently have your arm at the same length. Then, of course, if you're pushing your shoulder forward or moving it back, that's going to change everything. So what you really need to do is keep your shoulders level to your subject. Hold your pencil out at full arm's length. The top of the pencil against the top of a subject. I'm going to be naughty. I'm going to measure your head. And then you draw your thumb all the way down until you've measured whatever your subject is. And then you can turn that within the same plane to make comparisons. How many times does the height of the head fit inside the width of the shoulders? And, of course, if you're looking at extreme foreshortening, there can be lots of surprises in terms of how much one, you know, one measured part actually fits into another. So that's the business of measuring, of making comparisons. You don't then measure somebody and then put down that precise measurement. You're simply making comparisons to correct your drawing. I think it's always helpful to start off um, drawing intuitively, to draw what you would instinctively think is about right and only measure and make corrections if it's not working. Because if you start off by measuring, then you can actually end up with a drawing that's rather lacking in spirit. And the other thing is as to whether you want to make it technically accurate or not, it's personal choice because you might, have a far, you might produce a far more interesting drawing if it was not trying to be especially um, true to life, but you were actually changing proportions. So it's making, it's making that choice. Now, what else was I going to cover? And so I think that another thing that can also help when it comes to working um, with foreshortening is you think, well, that's all very well, but how do I get that onto a flat piece of paper? Uh, I had the privilege of being taught by Jane Greenham, who was married to Peter Greenham, who was one of the keepers of the Royal Academy of Art some years ago. And I can remember when I was a young student, Jane teaching me to imagine a flat sheet of glass in front of me and the subject that I'm trying to draw almost projected onto the back of that sheet of glass. Of course, the glass is then your piece of paper and you're drawing the shapes that you see. So one approach in drawing, because there's so many different ways of doing it, but one approach would be to see your subject as a series of flat shapes. And those shapes are things that you can then correct in terms of the width and the height of the shapes using that business of measuring and comparing. Of course, that's quite an academic way of drawing, but it's a very valuable process of learning. And it's something that you can apply to a really complex pose like this when you have got plenty of time to be able to really slow down and think and consider the relationship between all of these shapes. Okay. Complex pose. He probably needs a break. Probably does. Complexity. Be all right, and Andrew. We're going to reverse the pose in a minute for yes. 10 minutes just yes. to let everyone from home know that you'll get another 10 minutes of smug Andrew as Smuglerus in reverse. Okay. But Come and have a look at some of okay. the drawings that are being submitted. Oh, it's fantastic. time for a crit. Are we okay to leave Andrew like this for now? Yeah, or are you all right? You need to break. Okay. Ah, he wonderful. You can shake it out and then turn around in a minute. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. So, what I like about this is the energy of the mark that the person who's made it has kept that the vitality of the movement of the pencil across the surface. The proportions are good, and it's almost got a sense of humour as well in actually bringing the toe up. It might have been accidental in the way that it turned out, but coming up to almost sort of touch the head of the other figure. So they're well proportioned. Uh, lithe and limber. Here, lithe and limber. Here, there's clearly been a bit of a struggle with that limb, but it doesn't matter. One thing I would suggest is that with drawing head, to not go keep going round and round the outside of it. If anything, the outside is the bit of the head that doesn't exist. It's the volume in the middle that matters. So be brave enough to actually bring your lines in an exploratory way working across the surface. Ah, more. OK. More experience here. This person has done quite a bit of drawing. Now, so very nice dynamic. I believe in the bone structure and the strength of the figure just here. Um, this drawing is perhaps a little more 
sensitive and gentle in the handling of the marks, but there might be just a reproduction. Now here, one thing I would, forgive me whoever made this drawing, but I'm going to say that these are like, I'm going to be really rude, like this sort of way of treating tone, it's a useful way of thinking, but it can look like caterpillars crawling around the drawing. Anyway, so you've got this intensity of, um, of tone with areas where there's no tonal information at all. Anyway, so beware of the strength of mark that you've got. When I was talking over there about having, making a, a line that goes from here to here with great speed, when you give vigour to a mark, it sort of shouts quite loudly. So be careful that some elements of your drawing don't shout too loudly in relation to others. This one has a lovely fluidity to it. And it's interesting because the person who has made it has not been afraid of layering lines and having another thought and letting the outline of the body move as though it is actually breathing. So that's very nice. That's lovely. Terrific. Okay. Now, this is also useful to remember that the medium that you're working with, so this looks like a sort of a red charcoal or chalk, can also can be worked on its point and laid on its side. That remember to rotate and move the medium in your hands, not just work with the same point. Yeah, they're lovely. Wow. Good to always think about the background. This is a far more sculptural drawing. And so the person who has made this has been really thinking about volume and space and the relationship between the model and the background. I'm dominating. Do you want to talk about it? I don't know. I wouldn't. Well? I would, no, no. no. <laughs> okay. I, I could offer all sorts of criticism, but in this context, I won't. Okay. Because I'm in awe of the fact that people are A, doing it, and B, yes. sending it in to share. It is absolutely fantastic to see. So, it's, you know, thank you for sending these things in. Right. Okay. Lovely. Great colorist. Can we see more? I'd love to see more of this. That's beautiful. Really nice the way that the background has been worked in loosely to perhaps pre prepared and then the painting made over the top of it. Pieces of white paper are quite blinding and unforgiving to work with, and so working with a toned background or a pre-prepared canvas in this way can be much more exciting and dynamic. Andrew's definitely been a springboard for uh, this person's imagination, rather certainly than uh, this intense scrutiny. Okay. Certainly has. Again, here, an, a strong sense of balance and proportion. Again, be careful not to get too heavy with your outline, although it's, it works. Um, it does work. But you, just be careful that if you're giving the same consistent uh, tonal value to the outline, you can make it look a little flat. That doesn't necessarily matter if you're looking for a more of a, a design, if you like. But if you want the body to look more three-dimensional, then I would just undulate the pressure that you apply to the outside line so as to suggest the play of light on a three-dimensional receding surface. Last oh, one, I think. lovely. Look at that. OK. It's been terrific in this selection to be able to see various different approaches to drawing and different uses of media. So thank you to everybody who sent them in. Please send us more. Here, very brave and bold in this, this sort of simple line. Well, it's not simple. It's very sophisticated fluid. to be able to do. Really fluid line running through. It's not been overdone, not overplayed, which is also lovely to see, especially with hands and feet. There's often the temptation just to keep revisiting those points and add far too much information. I love the way the hair is described. That's a gorgeous story. And that line there, just providing a little bit of background information, is superb. Great, right. Let's um, keep them coming. Now, we're going to do a reverse pose, I think. OK. Andrew, we're going to turn the pose around the other way so that we then are able to see his back. Is that the idea? I think and? so. OK. So that people get the sense of seeing the pose in the round. Yes, exactly. Good. Superb. That's lovely. OK. So just to give the instructions, about eight minutes. Eight minutes. OK. So Ten front, eight back. Yes. <laughs> OK. 
So again, we've only got, you've only got enough time this evening just to sample ideas and to make, I hope, a, a kind of written and maybe a noted or drawn record of, of different things that you can return to, to try when you have a longer period of time. So on that note of cramming in as much as I can, and another element of drawing that's so important to think about is light. So far, we've talked about flat shapes, the shape of the subject, the shape of the space around them within a frame, and then how you're able to get those shapes right with for understanding foreshortening and measuring heights and widths of things. But then how do you actually turn your flat shapes into something that's three-dimensional? Well, the key is going to be your lighting and how you apply tone to a drawing. I don't think in eight minutes I can quite cover everything I would really like to say to you about tone, but I will tell you that Leonardo da Vinci described four kinds of light that I think it would be useful for you just to make a note of because they're worth thinking about later. So the four kinds of light that Leonardo lists in his notes, I'd also recommend you read his notebooks, they're inspiring, they're fascinating. Okay, the four types of light are ambient, as in, he described it as in the, the light level of the day between us and the horizon, okay, so the natural light level, ambient, that's one. The second is direct, which he described as being like the sunshine coming through an open window. Bright light actually shining directly onto a surface. Direct light, which is what we have this evening, although it's been very softly done. Then you have reflected light. Now, this is crucial if you're going to actually successfully make your form look three-dimensional. I would even recommend that you research reflected light and actually start searching for it in paintings and drawings as a single element to hunt for in the process of teaching yourself to draw. Look for examples of reflected light. Now, what this means is that as the light source comes down and directly strikes the subject, some of the light will come past the subject in front of and behind and strike a nearby surface and then be reflected back onto the other side of the subject, onto the shadow side. If you don't show reflected light on the shadow side of your subject, your subject will just seem to kind of melt into the shadows and not have that three-dimensional volume. So reflected light is incredibly important. And then the fourth type of light that Leonardo mentions is translucent. Not relevant here, but as what you can see through a membrane, say through leaves of a plant or through a piece of, piece of parchment or cloth. It's the light that shines through things. So again, those four elements are ambient, direct, reflected and translucent. When you're building the tone of your drawing, of course you'd require more than eight minutes for to be able to do, then build tone very slowly, very gently. Go, don't get too dark too soon, okay? But then also you're going to need to consider the relative tonality of the background because if you work up the tone inside the shape of your model on a white piece of paper but you give no tone to the background, you're going to be effectively seeing them in silhouette against bright light of white paper. So it'd be the equivalent of you looking at, a, a, to, to, you know, looking at my hand, say, against that light there. It goes into very sharp contrast. It's like a silhouette. So in any tonal drawing, it's an act of sculpture in a sense. It's dealing with the form in space. So it matters about the tonality of the background. Then, of course, as you're building tone then you have to simultaneously build texture. So whatever the surface is that you're drawing, you're trying to get your drawing, your hand, to emulate that sense of, that sense of the texture, in a sense, the sense of touch. In my own practice, when I'm drawing things, so again, this is not relevant with life models, except that you have to do it in your mind's eye, that I draw plants quite often, and I hold the plant in my left hand, and I draw it with my right and I hold it because I'm translating a sense of touch into my drawn marks, not just what I see. So if I were then in this life class drawing Andrew, I would translate my memory 
of the touch of skin, the feeling of skin under my fingertips. And I would be remembering that as I moved my charcoal or pencil as if it was touching or in contact with the skin, therefore evoking and suggesting the texture of it, which you're doing simultaneously with lighting. An awful lot to try and tackle at once, of course. Okay. How are we doing for time, I wonder? About five, five to go? Okay. It's interesting what you talked about with memory, because we're, we're seeing Andrew from behind in the smuggleries pose. Yes. And, of course, we've seen the frontal pose. Yes. And I've forgotten, because my memory isn't either good enough or I've now become so absorbed in the view from behind. And, of course, I know the view from behind is informed by yes. the traces in my memory of the front, but how much detail are you expecting me to maintain? Absolutely. That actually reminds me of something that uh, important to say, which is if you are in a life class where you're free to get up and move around and this is your view, I would strongly recommend that you get up and you go round and you look at the opposite view or other views and make studies of it because knowing what is happening on this side of the body enables you to inform your understanding of what's happening on that side. And so working three-dimensionally or in the round, making studies around a model is incredibly helpful if you've got the opportunity to make a longer pose. And then, of course, in terms of memory exercises, I think in the, oh, my art history is not good enough, but is it in the 19th century French academies? Then they used to have a practice of the model would be in the basement and the drawing studio would be in the attic. And so student, or not the attic, but the top floor where it was most sunny, perhaps. And the students would have to go down to the basement, look at the model, remember what they could, go all the way back up the stairs, and then remember to draw it. So a heck of a memory test when you've got a staircase in between you and your subject. But I think they used to do that kind of thing. One point I didn't make earlier that I, I, I missed that you'd need to think about before you even start drawing. It's very common in life drawing classes for me to find that someone has got an essentially horizontal pose and they've got their rectangular piece of paper arranged vertically on the easel and they're struggling to get it to fit in either side. So I should have said this at the beginning, but matching the orientation of your subject with the orientation of the piece of paper, is really helpful. <laughs> I, I should come and see how you guys are doing. I think there are a few students in the room that could have used that advice early on. <laughs> really? I, I realise I realize I've, I've, neglect, I've neglected to go, oh, aren't I a useless teacher? I forgot to tell you something that was incredibly important right at the beginning. Oh, I like the, the different material you're using. That's great. You know, the another thing that's, I think I've said this already, but I'm going to say it again. What's really exciting is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10 or 11 drawings I can see here of exactly the same subject, but incredibly different interpretations, both in terms of use of materials and ways of seeing. That's one of the most exciting things about art, is we have then the privilege of being able to see how someone else sees, you know, an insight into their mind and their experiences here this evening. So, terrific drawings we've got. Take a minute or so to finish on this, okay. if that...
Andrew, thank you very much. Now, we're going to shift from human anatomy to equine anatomy. Hovering over Andrew's poses yes. has been this extraordinary Corshaid horse. It is, yes. A teaching aid. Nicknamed Copenhagen, I believe, after the Duke of Wellington's child. Or yes, but not, probably not but cast it, from it. No, absolutely no, no. He died and was buried some time before. Now, it's a magnificent flayed or ecorchéed horse and so most of the superficial tissue has been removed so we're able to see the musculature at the front of the animal and at the rump I believe there's some, some skill in the middle it was donated to the academy in 1919 by the family of Philip um, Calder is that right who had been uh, who was an RA who had been running an, an animal anatomy and painting school here in London so it's another magnificent resource to be able to draw from it means that you have the opportunity to get incredibly close to a very dangerous albeit magnificent animal and be able to actually see uh, the detailed structure and the, the power of it as well we're talking of closeness the thing I like to get close to in the Academy because it's in our collections um, and we have one of the great collections of Stubbs drawings, this yes. great anatomy of a horse that he made in the, in the 1750s. Yes. Uh, and these are great teaching aids as well as accomplished works of art, like extraordinary works of art. They are. As a published book, there are 18 plates which show the anatomy of the horse running from skin down to bone through not just musculature, but also its cardiovascular system, its glandular system, its nerves. And this is something that Stubbs produced for artists, but that has been for as much use to, to veterinary surgeons in, in time since, and is unsurpassed. The history of it was that, so George Stubbs studied anatomy as a young man. He studied human anatomy first at the University uh, Hospital in York, I believe, when he was about 21. And then when he was 32, he hired a farmhouse in Lincolnshire. Ha <laughs> <And>, These drawings <laughs> almost seem to be making a noise. These drawings seem to be making a noise, these drawings. Yeah. Anyway, and um, he, he, over a period of 18 months, he dissected a large number of horses, six weeks per horse, um, assisted by Mary Spencer, his girlfriend, um, amazing woman, I think, to put up with this. Anyway, and so they were suspending the cadavers of horses from chains, putting them in a very lifelike pose. And then Stubbs was dissecting down through the layers from the skin, very carefully recording all of the structural information about the animal, which then enabled him to make all the more powerful portraits of horses, which he is so greatly famed for. Yeah, and, and transcending just the genre of horse painting and becoming yes. an underrated but major European painter, I think. Absolutely, yes. OK, um, one of the things I always think of when I look at these drawings is the smell that yes. must have emanated uh, after have weeks at a time studying these these horse cadavers. Distant farmhouse in the middle of the countryside was a very good idea, yes. I think so. Um, but there is not just the sound, but there's the smell of something equine now in there this room. There is, indeed. Charmingly. Uh, so let's reveal <laughs> okay. that we, we now have for the finale of the yes. live life class, Romeo. We have Romeo, who is, I believe, a Welsh mountain pony. Is that right? And so Romeo is our model for the remainder of the evening. And the plan was to really see how Romeo responded to being in the room. If he had decided to move around chewing your drawings, then we would have had the opportunity for lots of rather rapid poses. But as it is, he's standing magnificently still. So I would recommend that you grab your pencils and seize paper, the moment. <laughs> seize the moment and go for it. So think about the things that we've been talking about earlier about shape. And about was obviously a very different shape here between Copenhagen and Romeo, but isn't that magnificent as well to have the comparison? You're thinking about how you render form with texture. You can enjoy the fur, the very, very lovely dappled fur that he has on it. I'm not sure if you've got hair, isn't it, on a horse? Um, and then I would, just, I would just rapidly capture the moment. Now, the thing is, when you're working with animals, is that you're usually drawing them in their native environment, at home, when they're at home in the landscape, as it were, rather than in a studio. And so it's rare to have the opportunity to work with an animal who is standing so beautifully still for you. They're usually grazing or flying off or moving around. And so one thing I was going to just recommend is that if you are working outdoors with animals and they are going to move, is to not worry about that, but actually perhaps make sheets of studies that are collecting information about the animals, animal as it moves in front of you. 
So, for example, last winter I had a wonderful opportunity to travel across Wyoming and just for sheer pleasure on one occasion I was drawing a very large herd of elk as they were moving in front of me. And, of course, as they were continuously grazing, not a single animal stayed still for a moment. So I covered two pages of my sketchbook with very rapid drawings of all the different shapes that these animals made as they moved in front of me. And then I developed those drawings by layering information from different animals into the same image. So by the time I'd finished, all the elk that I drew were composites, although the viewer would never, a viewer would never know that um, in order to... Uh, when they're actually looking at it. So we'll give you... Uh, how long have we got an opportunity to draw Romeo? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, OK. No, 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 actually, we've got more. More, OK. Fifteen if, he's, 15. if, if Romeo's up for it. Wonderful. Well, I was thinking we could start off, give you this opportunity to draw his wonderfully static pose, because I think it really is very rare for an animal to behave so beautifully like this. Um, and then, well, uh, in, then shortly, when you've had an opportunity to, to, to start to grasp form and proportion and shape, is then if we ask for Romeo to be led around the studio, then it will give you the challenge of working with a moving subject. And, perhaps, and we'll see how he gets on with possibly stopping at intervals um, so that you have varied views. So lovely to have the comparison of the two next to each other. Yes, I wonder what he'll make of the accorded horse if he sees it. Well, he um, saw it earlier on when he came in, thought it was a real horse and brayed. Is that the right term? Whinnied. And, um, and then came over and just sniffed nose to nose, realised it's not a real horse and then ignored it. There are those completely invented stories about one of the reasons Whistlejacket stubs his masterpiece, arguably, I think yes. it is, um, yes. rearing up. Because when st uh, 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 the story is that when Stubbs was painting him out in the paddock um, of the Duke of Rockingham, uh, Whistlejacket saw his likeness and, and reared up. Well, first of all, I don't think Snubs would have had a, can a canvas mm. out there. But anyway, probably not. But, but I like but the idea that the horse is sort of somehow responds to the image. So in a minute, when, when we do take Romeo around. It'll be interesting to see how he responds to your drawings here yes, in the, in the live class. Yes, show him. <laughs> yeah. Shall we lead him round and see how he, how he gets on with perhaps just stopping, stopping at intervals? So... Or if we do... That's it. Probably very, very close to you. This is an, another issue with drawing, is ensuring that you're far enough away from your subject to actually be able to see it. <laughs> it's, uh... And then if you're not, if you are very close, then of course you have to have a change of strategy in terms of what it is that you're going to draw or best get out of the opportunity. This is definitely a first at the Royal Academy. We've it done many is. things in this organisation yes. and institution. Yes. <laughs> That's lovely. Again, just regularly stop, don't we? Oh. Would it work this time to try to keep him, say, this side of the grill as far as possible, but turn him round? Oh, I, I meant um, I meant slowly turn him within within this space so that he just I, I know it's naughty I know it's, it's I don't know quite was possible. It's quite tight for him. Yeah. By the way, without being rude, if, if you're having problems with force shortening at home, Romeo is quite small. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Thank you very much for coming and joining us today. Very interesting what you were saying, Sarah, about touch. I mean, obviously, the memory of the touch of skin, or we can touch our own skin, and it's 
both empathy and, and knowledge with the model, but yes. people's reactions with a horse and yours are yes. to touch. Yes, absolutely. We receive so much sensory information through touch, don't we? Yeah. It's also always going to be the reaction with another living, sentient being, isn't it? Yes, we agree. Interesting for me to come and see your drawings as well, to see what you've chosen to uh, focus on, whether you've chosen to draw the whole of Romeo or if you particularly enjoyed the opportunity to draw his head. I'm going to go and see what people have chosen to do. Yes, recurrent studies of head, whole torso. Oh, beautiful fluid. This is a lovely one. But do you mind if I run off with it ever so quickly just to show everyone at home? That is a very, very nice approach. And I realise I'm far too close to you, but um, is that helpful? I'm not going to keep it from the gentleman too long because he clearly hasn't finished and these sorts of spontaneous drawings need to not be interrupted. Another study of heads, a close-up of head. Head and torso, the torso. Yeah, it's interesting, the choice, the whole horse. Yeah, very nice. Lots of focus on outline, I noticed, though, with the exception of this drawing, which relies purely on outline, and that's beautiful. Then with the rest of you, dare to come across, to creep across into the centre of the form. Look at the magnificent coat that he has, the texture of it. You can play with the tonality there. Think about the texture on the face, not just the outline of it. So never be afraid to bring your drawn line or mark across a form into the centre. Got about seven more minutes, and those of you at home who've got some drawings you'd like to share, don't forget to submit them. It'd be great to see yes, some equine drawings. it would. So please, those of you drawing horse at home, send it in now. Let us see. Or Doesn't matter minutes, if it's yeah, five yeah. minutes. Yeah, work in progress is absolutely fine. You are so well behaved. Just in case anyone's just joining us. Um, yes. Which is slightly bizarre, I'd imagine, because yes. you're nearly at the end. But this is live drawing, drawing live. Life and you've, drawing. you've missed the human model, but yes. you've come in at the finale. And this is Romeo. It's a horse, an equine model. We have a very responsible approach and attitude to our collections, and I was hoping we might be able to bring the Stubbs drawings down here, but I think the feeling was amongst uh, the curatorial team was that having pretty important and fairly um, irreplaceable works of art in, the, in proximity to a live animal probably wasn't right. Probably not that right. probably is. But there's the opportunity to look online, decision. isn't there, to be able to... No, absolutely. So all of the drawings that we have looked at this evening, which are part of larger collections, those are going to be available for you to see, and I strongly recommend that you do. And you'll also look at Stubbs' working drawings, because what we had on screen were a couple of the finished plates, which are very, very different in how they're made and their, and their purpose as well. So with his preparatory drawings, you're really seeing his, him thinking about the subject and what he's going to do how we should present the information. As you say, also, one of the joys about a, a live stream class is that people can pause it and um, go back to it and, and, and study it at their own yes. pace. Yes, very much so. Did we have any questions this evening? From a, a I think people are too busy audience. drawing. Too busy drawing. I think we're going to give the, yeah. the, the feed, I think in the time we have, I think we're going to let people draw and then, and then give some feedback on the drawings that we've okay. had submitted. Okay. A shameless plug, of course, would be to say that I'm coming back in the summer to do a weekend course on the anatomy of the horse here at the Royal Academy. That in would be June. both shameless and a very important piece of information to well, share. Okay, all right. So, yes, in June, you'll find the information on the website and it's also shared on the site where you find information about this evening's session. So it'll be two days celebrating the horse in art and studying the anatomy of it using Copenhagen. And I'm going to bring my own skeleton of a horse with me as well, which is life-size, about the size of Copenhagen. So. There's a grimace from Romeo when you mentioned that. Was there? Ah. Oh. We'll invite you back too, sweetheart. <laughs> Say thanks, but I've got another offer. <laughs>
one of the things a human model rarely, if ever, does is mm. meet the gaze of those who are drawing. That's it very or true. Him. And Romeo is very conscious. I mean, he's curious and he's looking yes. around, and he's actually he's returning the gaze, isn't he? Yes, he is. That's a very interesting point. See some lovely pages of studies here where you're building up the, the sheet, you're building or filling the piece of paper. And that's something that's also important when you make a sheet of studies is it's not just to put a couple on and then change the page, but if you really fill it, it becomes all the more dynamic and interesting and, and worth keeping and looking at later. Of course, these sheets of studies are also things that you can return to later and add more from your memory. I often do that in my sketchbooks. I'll go out into the landscape and I will work for a while on numerous pages in the book and I've soaked in a memorised sense of the subject, of, where, of the place and of what I was drawing. And then later at night, I'll continue to work up those drawings and to develop them from memory and imagination. So often these unique opportunities are a time to be able to just pick up what you what is most essential right now and then leave for later embellishments that you know that you could do from memory do you like a change of pose since we still seem to be going to see if we could try to just turn him round a little bit just to give people a different view almost a sort of face on view if possible so that he faces the camera in the centre that's lovely a bit of foreshortening foreshortening of the horse a minute or so now ok Perfect. <laughs> Romeo's just left his mark, and I think that's very important. It is.
Okay, we'll let Romeo just a couple more minutes for the for okay. the class in the classroom. But we've got some okay. images that people Great. are sending through on social media. Okay, super. So let's let's see the um, the equine drawings. Oh, lovely! Look at that. Great. Good to see someone who's actually really been brave enough to work with the texture of the horse and to find a way of trying to describe the pattern. That's always interesting, the difference between texture and pattern. And then it's very nice also to see movement in the, the rear end of the horse here in terms of not being entirely certain about where, aha, where, um, where, the, where the outline should be and so dissolving the outline, which suggests the animal is moving, which is very nice. What else have we got? Ah, look at that, great movement in the head this time, a nice expression. And then also um, good structure in terms of, it's in interesting to see the single line running over. And then the contrast between the simplicity of single lines describing some parts and then much more uh, sort of denser, shorter marks describing part of what's happening with the head just there. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, again, a nice example of working with um, two tones or three tone drawing so that you've got your dark, your white, um, oh, actually through with the colour and on, and on the toned paper. So it means that you can start to work with volume and depth and form much more easily than you can when you're just working straight onto a white piece of paper because a lot of the tonal um, values are already put in place for you. Okay, so, so okay. We, we've, we're just having a few more of Andrew, just to okay. end with. Yes. I don't want to make, a, make it, well, I'll do a comparison, but I don't yes. want to make a competition. Do we find it easier as human beings to draw the human form rather than the, the, the form of other animals, or is, is, is that's not really an issue? It's going to be hard to tell, because it's, but I think we, can, we draw what is most familiar to us more easily, and so perhaps people who are attending the life class here and are sending in their works have done life drawing before, but not necessarily drawn a horse before. But... Um, I don't know. I th the thing with, with life drawing is that because we all have a body and we know what it looks like, in a sense, it's, it's less forgiving. If, if something's really not working or not right, we know instantly. I suppose we are familiar with the form of, with the form of a pony, but uh, you, you, could, you could wobble a little bit more with the pony and wouldn't necessarily see it. And what about drawing yourself? It's self-portrait? Yes. Or self-anatomical uh, self studies, self using yourself as something to scrutinise. Ah, OK. No, I think studying your own body is, is, is a hugely helpful resource, particularly working with a mirror, so that then means that you've got um, the, the, the reflected view as well as what you can actually see directly. Uh, that's particularly helpful when you're drawing hands and feet, which are the most complex and difficult part of the body to draw besides the head, I suppose particularly with the hands because they're so loaded with expression. Um, so working, drawing your own hands and drawing them in the mirror is very helpful. I beg to differ, actually. The most difficult part of your own body to draw is your back, which... Well, you know, <laughs> depends how you hold the mirror. I suppose it does, or how many mirrors you have. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Anyway, I think there's the, the, the okay. a couple of images on which to end. OK. Beautiful. Yes. So again, this person's really taken on board the idea of having a depth of shadow that then the illuminated body comes out of. And it's um, a nice fluid outline that's not too overworked. Um, again, I think it's, it's, it's the, the vigor of the mark does still work in relation to the subtlety of the drawing, um, but it's, sort of, it's just on the edge in places. Ah, very nice. So presumably that's red chalk. That's interesting the way that the volume is described by being able to see through the form as well as on its surface. So this is a lovely example of what I was talking about, of not being afraid to come in from the outline of the body. And very nice rendering of the head as well, where you were not seeing it as outline. There's just a trace of a mark there in order to be able to find it, but then they've gone to tone and not given us eyes, nose, and mouth as well, which we don't need them. So it's actually nice to have left that out. <laughs> OK. Curious sounds going on in the background Yeah, now. I think we've almost... I think, we've, okay. we, I, think that, that, I think we have a horse that needs to go and have a drink. I think we do. We have a class Indeed. that needs to go and have a yes, drink. Yes, that's true. Um, I think the, the response, the public response, is, is kind of embodiment of what you were saying, is that yes. people see things in different ways. Very different ways. Render things in different ways. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Romeo. Please. Anyway. That's it from okay. the Royal Academy Schools. Thank you for joining us for Live yes. Drawing Live. And Sarah, thank you so much for taking the class. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for Good joining night. us. Good night. Good night.